Happy St. Patrick's Day to those who celebrate it. However, if you came to church today expecting a St. Patrick's Day message, I am sorry to disappoint you. <clears throat> when I was given this wonderful opportunity to preach for you all a second Sunday in the month of March, Women's History Month, my first thought was to prepare a service that honors the great Unitarian Universalist women who have made history. Unitarian Universalist history is rich with remarkable women whose courage, vision, and dedication have shaped our faith and society. From Margaret Fuller, the pioneering journalist and women, women's rights activist, to Clara Barton, founder of the American Red Cross, and Olympia Brown, the first woman ordained as a minister in the United States, these trailblazing women inspire us with their resilience and commitment to justice. Their stories remind us of the transformative power of individuals to effect change and to challenge the status quo. Yet as I reflected on the lives of these well-known figures, I found myself continually drawn to the quieter narratives, the stories of women who may never find their names in history books or on plaques. While we celebrate the achievements of Fuller, Barton, and Brown, we must also recognize that their stories represent only a fraction of the diverse experiences of women throughout history. There are countless unsung heroines, mothers, daughters, activists, caregivers, and community leaders whose names may be forgotten, but whose contributions to their families, communities, and the world are no less significant. And just as we can glean truth from the lives of famous women throughout history, we can learn just as much, if not more, from the ordinary women in our lives. This is a lesson I learned many years ago. In the summer of 1999, I had just come home from Free Gospel Bible Institute, Pentecostal seminary I attended. Because I had driven from school in Pittsburgh to my parents' house in South Carolina the night before, I slept rather late that day. When I did awake, I found a note on the dining room table written in my mother's familiar handwriting. The note simply read, pray for mama, she has cancer. I distinctly remember feeling overwhelmed by conflicting emotions. My grandmother, whom my brother, most of my cousins and I always affectionately referred to as Mama, had always been a fixture in my life. So the thought of losing her was devastating. But as a young Pentecostal minister, I refused to acknowledge my fear because I thought that admitting I was afraid would mean I lacked faith. And I needed God to know that I had faith that everything would be okay. During the next few months as she underwent chemotherapy, I continued my pretense that I was some sort of bulwark of faith. Not only did I feel this was necessary for my prayers to be effective, but it was also much easier than facing my fear of losing her. But I was eventually forced to face this dreaded possibility one day that fall when Mema called me to her house and asked me to bring my computer with me. As I sat down at her kitchen table, she asked me to record her wishes for her funeral service. Despite my objections and confident assurances that it was unnecessary to discuss the possibility that she would succumb to her disease, she insisted. Going into extraordinary detail, she named the location of her funeral every song that was to be sung, who would be her pallbearers, and even what colors everyone in the family was to wear that day. The only request that lacked specificity was her final wish. I want you to say some words, she said. I don't want nobody to preach, just say some words. Somewhat confused by this vague instruction, I asked what she meant and why she felt so strongly that no one should preach at her funeral. I will never forget her response. You preach your own funeral, she responded, by the life you live. I kept her final wishes on a 3.5 millimeter floppy disk saved on a Microsoft Word document that I planned to open on the day of her passing. But I never opened that file because she beat cancer and she long outlived the technology I had used to transcribe her final wishes. <laughs> But on February 2nd, 2021, around midnight, I received a phone call from my aunt who in a broken voice, a voice broken by her tears, said, Mama's gone. I left my home in Savannah and made the 90 mile drive to my parents' house where I awoke my mother 
gave her the news, and then together we drove to Mama's house to see her one final time before the funeral home took her body away. So much had changed in the 22 years since I had reported my grandmother's final wishes. One notable change was that I was no longer an ordained minister, so I did not expect to be asked to say some words, as Mama had once asked of me. My family did ask me to write a poem to be read aloud at her funeral service. Remembering the words she said to me on that fall afternoon in 1999, I wrote this poem entitled, She Preached. She never stepped behind the pulpit to bring the message of the hour in a booming voice to reach the lost with authority and power. She never roused an audience to their feet with fanciful words and eloquent speech, but she lived a sermon every day, and Lord, did she preach. We were blessed to be her congregation, each moment with her in exhortation that convicted without judging, never demanding but gently nudging us in the direction we should go. When we refused to listen, we still heard. Her every deed and every word was a message from the Lord, and Lord, did she preach. She preached a life that taught me to persevere when weighed down by troubles and drowning in fear. To face the waves and the winds, I remind myself that I descend from a woman whose faith never faltered, though her vessel was rocked to the core by the waters of life's tempestuous sea. I find strength in her life's homily, and Lord, did she preach. No greater message of love was ever spoken or penned than the one she lived before family and friends who, even when we were mired in sin, knew a woman who could see past our failings. Unconditional love always waiting on the front porch in a rocking chair. With curlers in her silver hair, she had a message of love to share, and Lord, did she preach. And now as her sermon comes to its close and the preacher retires to her heavenly abode to receive her eternal reward, join the angels as they give her a round of applause. Shout amen for a sermon, powerful and true, not preached from a pulpit, but practiced before you. Her life was her sermon, and Lord, did she preach. One of many unique aspects of being a Unitarian Universalist is the freedom we have to draw from multiple sources of inspiration in our search for truth. We find truth in the sacred liturgy and the teachings of not a single religion, but various world religions. We're not limited to traditionally religious sources, however, even in our search for truth. Our canon of scripture includes nature, science, secular wisdom, humanist teachings, as well as our own day-to-day -day experiences. Each of these speaks truth to our souls with the same authority as the pages of the Bible or other religious text. I'll admit, when I began preaching to Unitarian Universalist congregations, it took me some time to avail myself of this liberty. My previous experience as a minister had trained me to begin every sermon with a passage from the Bible, and since that was and remains the religious text with which I am most familiar, it was difficult for me to break from this pattern. Once I did break free, however, I have found that some of the most impactful messages I have preached were inspired by personal experiences or favorite novels. Religious and spiritual truth is not something that is hidden away on the pages of religious text. It is all around us, revealing itself to all who are open to receiving it. Among these many sources of inspiration and revelation, probably the most obvious, but possibly the most overlooked, are the people in our lives. It took the passing of my grandmother for me to realize that her life spoke truth to me in ways more powerful than any oration that was ever given from behind a pulpit. My grandmother was not a well-educated woman. In fact, she did not learn to read until her early 50s when two nuns began holding adult literacy classes at the community center. But when she did learn to read, she read every day of her life. She was not well-traveled. Although she was born and raised just 30 miles from the coast, she was in her 60s the first time she saw the ocean. But on the few occasions in her life in which she was able to leave the familiarity of home, she took those opportunities. She couldn't boast of world travel, but she could talk to you all day long about the time she went to New York City. <laughs> she was not a wealthy woman, she was born in extreme poverty, and she died in extreme poverty. But poverty was no match for her generosity. I recall the first summer that I came home from seminary. I immediately began searching for a summer job, but finding a place willing to hire me for just a few months and, and also give me Sundays off 
to preach proved difficult. Sitting on my grandparents' porch one Sunday afternoon, my grandfather sat next to me, reached into his pocket, handed me a $100 bill, and said, don't tell your mama I gave that to you, all right? I agreed and came into the house. Soon as I shut the door, my grandmother reached into her purse, pulled out a $100 bill, and said, don't tell your papa I gave that to you, all right? A $200 gift to a grandchild may not seem like much to many of us, but on their tiny fixed income, this was a tremendous sacrifice. Yet it was just one of the many ways she defied the grip of poverty on her life. Like Jesus, who in his first miracle turned water into wine, she had a way of making poverty not merely presentable, but she transformed it into something that looked, felt, and tasted like the finest wine. Her tiny single-wide trailer was always immaculate, as if she were expecting a visit from royalty. Every meal at her kitchen table was delectable. Even when times were hardest and she had very little to work with, I wouldn't trade her salmon patties and greasy rice for the finest cuisine in the fanciest restaurant. And though there was barely room to walk in her tiny kitchen, there was room at the table for everyone. Although there were, are so many lessons I could take away from the life she lived, this is the one that resonates the most with me. When she passed, there were two things that I asked for. One being her dining room table. It was not an antique was not incredibly expensive, and it will never hold any value beyond its sentimental worth. But long before the phrase safe space had been given negative, negative connotations by some, it was my safe space. It was where I found unconditional love and acceptance. It is where I learned to be an open and empathetic person to others. The other thing I asked for when my grandmother passed is one of her front porch swings specifically one of her single swings. Typically a front porch swing is made to seat two or three people. But my grandmother asked my grandfather to build her a swing just large enough for one person. We jokingly accused her of being antisocial as she sat on the front porch in her single swing, but she was not antisocial. If she were, her porch would not have had multiple swings and rocking chairs as it did. Like her dining room table, her porch was open to anyone who wished to come and sit with her, just not in the same swing. <laughs> See, she didn't have a problem with people. She just preferred to swing at her own rhythm and pace. Her front porch swing and her, excuse me, her front porch and single swing were a metaphor for a perspective on life that I hope to emulate. Like my grandmother, I hope to be a person whose metaphorical front porch is a refuge to anyone who needs to sit down and rest a while. They don't have to share my thoughts, opinions, or values. As long as they let me swing at my own rhythm, they can sit down with me and swing the way they like. Expanding our circles to encompass a diverse array of perspectives enriches our lives immensely. My grandmother's single swing epitomizes this ethos. Despite its solitary nature, her porch was never devoid of companionship. The variety of seating options spoke volumes about her welcoming spirit, inviting individuals from all walks of life to engage in conversation and connection. It wasn't about conformity, it was about coexistence. In a world fixated on uniformity, my grandmother's porch stood as a testament to the beauty of individuality within community. Just as she maintained her own rhythm on that swing, we too can honor our uniqueness while embracing the myriad melodies of those around us. By doing so, we foster a tapestry of understanding and empathy, transcending the boundaries of difference to find common ground in our shared humanity. There are only two instances, to my knowledge, in which someone was not welcome on my grandmother's porch. The first time was when, immediately after my, grandma, my grandfather passed, a gentleman in the community <clears throat> heard there was a single woman in her 80s and came a calling. I don't think I've ever laughed harder than when she told me the story of how she, quote, put him in the road <laughs> and told him, John ain't even cold in the grave yet. The other instance in which someone was banished from my grandmother's front porch is most personal to me. Shortly after I resigned from my position as a Pentecostal minister and came out as openly gay, someone spotted me in a gay club in Charleston. 
and gossip traveled quickly from Club Pantheon in Charleston to the Edisto Natchez Cuso Reservation. When my great aunt, my grandmother's sister, came to deliver the gossip, Memas stopped her and lovingly but bluntly let her know she was always welcome on her front porch, but any negative statements about her grandson were never welcome. Many people in my grandmother's family shunned me. My grandmother's community judged me. Her faith condemned me. But she never showed me anything less than love. The words that best describe her, words I once had printed on a t-shirt, are unconditional love wrapped up in one tiny little Indian woman. <laughs> my final story about my grandmother. One Sunday morning after church, I went, as I often did, to my grandparents' house. On this rare occasion, however, my grandfather took my grandmother out to eat, so I stayed at their house alone. After a little while, my stomach began to growl, and so I went in search of something to eat. I was pleased to find a delectable pot of collard greens in the refrigerator, and so I placed the pot on the stove, turned it on, and waited for my delicious greens to warm up. Then I heard a terrifying sound, a loud cracking noise. And I realized that what I had placed on the stove was not a regular cooking pot. It was the ceramic insert for a crock pot. And as I grabbed it off the stove, I realized that what I realized what that cracking sound was as the bottom of the crock pot fell to the floor, splattering collard greens all over my grandmother's spotless kitchen. My terror intensified as I looked out the window and saw my grandfather's truck pulling into the driveway. When she entered the house, I thought for sure I was about to experience the wrathful woman I had only heard about in stories from my mother. But as she looked at me on the floor, trying to clean up my mess, she just shook her head and said, I ain't gonna holler. <laughs> she wanted to holler. She wanted to do far more than just holler at me. But her love for me was greater than her love for her immaculately clean kitchen. Throughout my life, I have made many messes, messes far worse than spilled collard greens, but she never hollered at me. She never scolded me. She never so much as gave me a disappointing look. She just loved me. My grandmother's response to my kitchen mishap epitomized the concept of unconditional love. In that moment of chaos and spilled greens, she demonstrated a love that transcended any frustration or disappointment. Her ability to extend grace and forgiveness in the face of my mistake left an indelible mark on my heart. It serves as a poignant reminder that love, at its core, is not contingent upon perfection or flawlessness. It is a force that embraces us in our messiness, offering solace and understanding when we falter. Just as my grandmother's love encompassed my missteps, may we strive to emulate such compassion in our interactions with others extending grace freely and unconditionally, recognizing that it is through our imperfections that we truly connect and grow together. I invited some other members of the congregation to share the ordinary yet extraordinary women who have influenced them. Dr. Adrian Cohen shared the legacy of Miss Judy Music, her friend and mentor. Dr. Cohen wrote, she helped carry me through some of the darkest days of my life. She taught me to seek out fairies and other mystical creature, mythical creatures in the wilds of nature, to always remember what I am grateful for, and to hold on to the gift that is today. KT Geiger Phillips shared the legacy of Miss Mary Jackson, affectionately known as Nanny. She wrote, I felt compelled to share a little something about each of my grandmothers because they were all incredibly inspiring in their own way, but I'll just share about my husband's. We call her Nanny. She is literally my best friend. We talk at least six times a week. All my grandparents have long since passed and she does her absolute best to fill the void, that void for me. She had a tough upbringing, poverty, abuse, abuse deaths, etc. But somehow she's the most well-adjusted person I know. She raised her siblings, then raised her kids, then adopted another, then raised her grandkids and is now raising some of the great grants. She literally saved my life once when I was truly in a dark place. So many of us owe her so much. Nanny is the most extraordinary, ordinary woman I know. These stories shared by members of our congregation beautifully illustrate the profound 
impact ordinary yet extraordinary women have had on our lives. From mentors who guide us through the darkest days to grandmothers who become our closest confidants and saviors in times of need, these women embody the essence of love, resilience, and compassion. They may not be celebrated in history books or adorned with accolades, but their legacies endure in the hearts and minds of those whose lives they have touched. As we reflect on the lessons learned from our own ordinary heroines, let us carry forward their spirit of kindness, generosity, and unwavering support. In honoring their contributions, we honor the countless unsung heroines whose quiet strength and grace continue to shape our world for the better. Amen. And may it be so.